Hey, praise the Lord. I am Michael Jackson. Welcome to the Line by Line podcast. You've joined us for our Monday night Bible study, which is also called. Amen. We pray that all is well with you once again as we do open up the Word of God. Tonight, we are beginning and continuing, rather, our study through the book of Romans. This is a verse-by-verse study, and we will be in Romans chapter number 9. Amen. And in Romans chapter number 9, Paul is going to uh, sort of turn a page yes, yeah, he has been speaking about justification and sanctification. He's still on that vein, but he's going to turn his attention to his, at least in these first few verses, his burden for Israel. And he's going to say some things that we, that it may be difficult to hear and even difficult to understand. Uh, but we under, we will understand by the end of this chapter that God is sovereign. Amen. So we thank you for joining us. We pray that all is, all is well for you. We pray that your time spent in God's word will be a fruitful one. Amen. So we thank you for joining us. God bless you, uh, Yvonne. And God bless you, Kathleen and Linda and Frank. God bless you. Thank you for joining us. If you're watching us over Facebook, we ask that you share out this page, that others also may be blessed. Uh, we also ask that if you're watching on, on YouTube, you can also send a link uh, to someone and they can also be a part of what we do here. Amen. So God is good. We're going to pray and we're going to get right into this study for tonight. Lord, we honor you and we bless you. We thank you once again, Lord, you have given us this opportunity to once again open up your word. Lord, we know that the words that we're about to speak concerning uh, Israel and your will, Lord, may sound very difficult. But Lord, we have to take it all with the understanding that, Lord, that you are in control. You are sovereign above all. So, Lord, we bless you and we leave these things into your hands. Lord, I pray that you will, as your word goes forth tonight, that you will speak to our hearts, Lord Jesus. Lord, we don't want to do any violence to your word. Lord, we pray that you, uh, you alone, Lord Jesus, might be glorified as we open up your word tonight. Draw those who need to hear these words at this time to this place on the World Wide Web. Lord, have your way. We bless you. We honor you. We thank you. And it's in your name that we pray, Lord Jesus. Amen and amen. Well, hallelujah. God is good. God is good. Amen. So we are going to be in Romans chapter number nine, Romans chapter number nine. Amen. Uh, and once again, as th these first few verses, Paul is going to uh, really uh, expose himself and speak about his burden. He's going to be very uh, transparent here as he talks about these things. So let's start here in chapter number nine and verse number one. I say the truth in Christ. I lie not my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost. Now notice, notice to what lengths uh, Paul goes to, to tell us of what he is about to say. He says, listen, I'm telling you the truth in Christ. He says, listen, I'm not lying. He says, my conscience is bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost. So he is very serious about this statement that he's going to make, which is verse number two, that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. Great sorrow, and con that word heaviness is sorrow. Uh, I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. He is at grief when he thinks about the plight and the spiritual condition of his kinsmen, his brothers, uh, his ethnic brothers, his the, his Jewish family. He, he, he is at grief when he thinks about their state. Uh, verse number three, for I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. Now, we spoke about this uh, a little bit last time when we got together. God bless you, Dawn. Uh, we spoke about this a little bit last week when we got together, uh, when we spoke about uh, that Paul's, that as Paul uh, said these words, uh, he echoed the same sentiments as Moses did. Uh, Moses also uh, made a statement to the effect that God, uh, please, Lord, uh, uh, erase my name from your book. If it would save your people, if it would forgive your people, Lord, erase my name from the book. Paul says that he would uh, that he would wish that himself were accursed. In other words, that, that he would be alienated uh, from God uh, without any hope of redemption. That's what Paul is saying right here. And so this, this, what Paul is saying is, this is the definition of a burden. He has a burden for his brothers, not brothers in Christ, a burden. He does have a burden for the his brothers and sisters in Christ also, but he is talking about his kinsmen in the flesh. 
his fellow Jews. He has a deep burden for them. And he goes in verse number four and identifies who they are. He says, who are Israelites to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises. Understand that the Jews, for the most part, his kinsmen in the flesh, they hated him. The Jews hated Paul. Okay, they had they had no use for Paul at all, but yet he loves them. And so we understand uh, that Paul is here uh, displaying the heart of Jesus. He is displaying the heart of Jesus. We know that Jesus loves unconditionally. Unconditionally, he loves. In that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. who We did not deserve it, but yet and still he died. Amen? For us. And so Paul here is, is, is displaying that same type of uh, attitude, that same type of heart, uh, uh, that same type of heart that he would give himself up, sacrifice himself for his kinsmen. But notice, as we said in verse number four, he's talking about the Israelites. And this, what he, the things that he is saying in verse number four, I believe only deepens his sorrow at their plight. Because look at how much, he says, look at how much the Jews have been blessed. Look how much my kinsmen in the flesh have been blessed by God. He says, he says, to whom pertaineth the adoption. And the adoption is just talking about God's sovereign choice of them. Why did God choose the Jews? Because God chose the Jews, okay? That there is nothing in the Jew that makes them or made them better than any other group of people. It was just God's sovereign choice. It was not based on anything but God's own choice. Now, once again, we said that we're going to say some things here tonight based on what the word says here uh, that may sound, that may be difficult to hear or even difficult to understand. But we have to understand that God is absolutely, and I mean absolutely sovereign, and he is not unjust or unkind in any way, shape, or form. He does everything that he does out of love and through his sovereignty. We have to take that into consideration when we read these words that we will be reading. And so, to whom pertaineth the adoption, his sovereign choice of them, he goes on. And the glory, and the glory. He's talking about the Shekinah glory that we read about throughout the book of, of Exodus, which uh, the Shekinah glory represented God's uh, represented God's and symbolized God's presence with them. It was a, a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. They did not have the Holy Spirit with them as we do, as we do. But they had they had the, the presence of the Lord visibly with them. At least the Jews during that season, during that time, they had the Shekinah glory cloud that they saw that assured them that God is with us. God is with us. We don't need that. We don't need that physical representation of God. We have the Holy Spirit in us. He dwells in us. Amen. Romans 8, 11, the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead dwells within us. Amen. And we have to keep that in mind. He goes on in verse number four, and the covenants, and the covenants. Now, when speaking about the covenants, he's speaking about at least four different covenants that were given to uh, the Jews. Uh, he's talking about uh, the, the Abrahamic covenant. He's talking about the Palestinian covenant. He's talking about the Mosaic covenant. He's talking about the new covenant, which the new covenant uh, pushed the Mosaic covenant out of the way in the sense that the new covenant, the Mosaic covenant is what we call the old, the old covenant or old Testament. And the new covenant is a better covenant. Amen. So these four covenants, that's what he is speaking about here. They were given to the Jews. They're blessed. They're blessed. He goes on. And the giving of the law, the giving of the law, which is part of that Mosaic covenant. The law was given to the Jews, to the Jews. Amen. Now, it's another discussion, which we're not going to get in here tonight, uh, as to the purpose of the giving of the law. The purpose of the law was to bring them, of course, to Christ. We understand that from the book of uh, Galatians. Uh, he goes on. And the service. 
the service is talking about all of the rituals connected with the tabernacle and the temple, including the priesthood. He's talking about the service. And so all of these things, all of these things were part of the blessing that God gave to the Jews sovereignly, sovereignly. Amen. Uh, and the promises, the promises, God, God's guarantee that he would provide, that he would protect uh, and that he would uh, give them peace and prosperity. His promises, amen? And so that, that's all entangled within, within the covenants, amen? And so God has been good to the Jews. Paul is making this statement, and yet and still, they have, in colloquial terms, they have missed the boat. They have missed the boat. We'll talk about why and how that has happened. Verse number five, whose are, talking about the Jews, whose are the fathers, and of whom, as concerning the flesh, Christ came who is overall God blessed forever. Amen. There's several points that he's making in this particular verse. First, he's talking about the fathers. Whose are the fathers? The Jews. From the Jews came the fathers. And those fathers he is speaking about is are Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They are the fathers. Amen. Uh, and of whom, as concerning the flesh, Christ came. Christ came from these fathers, okay, his lineage, his genealogy, he comes from these uh, these men, these fathers, amen, who is overall, talking about Christ, who is overall God blessed forever. Now, in this singular statement, he is also making a point, he is speaking about the fact that Jesus is God. Jesus is God. In the Greek, this phrase this phrase, uh, Christ came, who is overall God blessed forever, is translated the eternally blessed God. Jesus, the eternally blessed God. He is, he is making a bold pronouncement here. Jesus is God. Okay, Jesus is God. Let's never, ever forget that. And amen. Let's all agree. Amen. Let's all agree to that. Verse number six. Not as though... The word of God hath taken none effect. For they are not all Israel, which are of Israel. Now, what is he saying here in verse number six? He's simply saying that not all of Abraham's physical descendants are to be the recipients of his spiritual blessings. This is the, the spiritual blessings are based on reception of and faith in Christ. That's what th that's what he means here. And so when he talks about not as though the word of God, he's talking about the promises uh, have taken none effect because there are Jews who are saved and there will be many more Jews that are saved that have placed their faith in Jesus Christ as their savior. Okay, that's important to remember. Verse number seven, neither, neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children, but in Isaac shall thy seed be be called. In Isaac shall thy seed be called. We go to uh, Genesis chapter number 21. He is going to, he is going to run off uh, Paul here, a, a litany of Old Testament uh, scriptures to, to make his point. And he, this first one is coming from uh, Genesis chapter 21 and verse number 12. Here's what it says. And God said unto Abraham, let it not be grievous in thy sight because of the lad and because of thy bondwoman. In all that Sarah has said unto thee, hearken unto her voice. For in Isaac shall thy seed be called. In Isaac shall thy seed be called. And so that's what this reference is uh, to when he says, in Isaac shall thy seed be called. Verse number eight. That is, and to explain, that is, they which are the children of the flesh these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted for the seed. In other words, those who believe in the promise, that is Christ, are the promised seed. Amen. Those who believe. Abraham's physical descendants are not necessarily, as we said, the recipients of the children, the recipients of of the promises or the blessing of God. That is based on faith 
in Christ. Now, I want to go to Galatians chapter number four and verse number 28, because I want to say a word about this, uh, the word children in this particular verse, when he says the children are the promise, the children of the promise are counted for the seed or, or as the seed. Let me go to Galatians uh, chapter number four and verse number 28. Here's what it says. Galatians chapter 4 and verse number 28. It says simply, Now we brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of the promise. As Isaac was, we are the children of the promise. Verse number 9. For this is the word of promise. At this time will I come and Sarah shall have a son. He's quoting from Genesis chapter 18 and verse number 10 and verse number 14. Verse number 10. And not only this, but when Rebecca also had conceived by one, even by our father Isaac. Isaac. In other words, she was conceived through through this one man Isaac. Okay? He was uh she was con he was conceived rather. She conceived through uh Isaac. That's what he means when he says also had conceived by one talking about by Isaac, amen, by our father Isaac. Verse number 11, for the children being not yet born. This is very important to understand. He says, this is based on what he's about to say uh, is not based on the fact of something that they did. He says, but for the children not yet being born, neither having done any good or evil. They haven't done anything yet. OK. That the purpose of God, according to election, might stand not of works, but of him that calleth everything that would happen to everything that would happen uh, to uh, Jacob and Esau was not based on anything that they had done previously, because God had God had, as it says here, According to the election might stand not of works, but of him that calleth. God's will. God's will. They had done nothing wrong. They had done nothing right. It was said unto her. He's going to quote now from Genesis chapter 25, verse number 23. It was said unto her, the elder shall serve the younger. Verse 13. As it is written, Jacob have I loved but Esau have I hated. Now that is very, very difficult language. How do we take these words spoken by God himself? Jacob have I loved and Esau have I hated. It's best to see these words as the fact that God chose Jacob and he rejected Esau based on his foreknowledge based on his foreknowledge, based on what he knew about each individual, not based on what he would cause each individual to do, not based on what he would make each and every one, each one of them do. It was based on what he knew that they would do. God knows. God knows the choices that you will make. Whether they are good or whether they are bad, God knows what choice you are going to make. You don't even know what you're going to do. You think you know what you're going to do. We know what we hope we are going to do as far as the good goes. But God knows the choices that we make before we make them. Before we make them. And that is, and what he says here, that Jacob have I loved and Esau have I hated should not be taken in the strict emotional sense. I hate you. I love you. That's not what is going on here when, when it says this. This is talking about once again God's foreknowledge of what each one what he knew that each one would do. And based on what based on what he knew that we don't know, based on what he knew he chose Jacob, but he did not choose uh Esau. Based on what they did. What based on what he knew they would do, not based on what they did. Okay? Based on what he knew that they would do. Okay? And we see this statement uh, it's in Malachi uh, chapter number one. That's where that's where we first see the statement about uh, loving Jacob and hating Esau. And I know this statement has 
has brought a lot of confusion to many people. How can God be that way? Okay, and he's going to address that here too. Uh, uh, verse number 14, verse number 14. So what shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? God forbid. In other words, is God being mean? Is God being unfair? Uh, is God being unreasonable? Is God being unrighteous? Paul says, God forbid. Of course not. No way. That's what he says here. No, God is not being mean. He's not being, he's not being unrighteous. He's, he's none of those things. Four, verse number 15. And he understands that it's coming from those who would question what God would do or should do based on their understanding, based on their understanding. We would hear what we are reading here. We, we see the fact that it says that Jacob, I love Esau, I hate. And we immediately, we immediately put up stop signs. Whoa, whoa, whoa. What's going on here? And we immediately in our, in our hearts and minds, uh, we begin to say, what does, wait. God is loving one and hating them. Okay, and, and based on that, he says, verse number 15, for he saith to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. That's from Exodus chapter 33 and verse number 19. God is God. Once again, we're talking about the sovereignty of God. God is God. And that's as, that's as simple and as blunt as it can be said. God is God, and he will show mercy on whom he will have mercy, and he will show compassion on whom he will have compassion. He is God. He goes on. He goes on. Verse number 16. So then it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. Okay, let me say that again. So then it is not, he says, so then it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. He's, what he is saying, what he is not, let me say what he's not saying here. He is not saying that the will is not involved when a person comes to the Lord. Notice what it says here. So then it is not of him that willeth. Once again, God is sovereign. God is sovereign. Our salvation is wrapped up in him. Our salvation is wrapped up in him and who he is. He is not saying that God just, you're saved, you're saved, you're saved, and you'll be saved, and you will not. Be. That's not what he is saying. So the will, the will is involved in our salvation. The will is involved. So let me go uh, to Revelation uh, chapter number 22 and verse number 17. Revelation chapter 22 and verse number 17. It says, and the spirit and the bride say, come. And let him that heareth say, come. And let him that is a thirst, come. And whosoever will, whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. Whosoever will, whosoever decides, whosoever will come. Okay. Also, we read in the book of John, John chapter number five and verse number 40, John chapter number five and verse number 40. He's, he chides the Jews. He chides the Pharisees actually. And he says, and ye will not come to me that ye might have life. You, you, you choose not to make the choice to come to me. So there is a volitional choice, a, volit a volitional act of the will that must take place if we are to come to Christ. Amen. That must happen. Luke uh, chapter number 13, Luke chapter number 13, as concerning what he says here, uh, where he says, uh, nor of him that runneth, nor of him that runneth, talking about works. But here's what it says here uh, in Luke chapter number 13 and verse number 24. Strive, strive to enter in at the straight gate. For many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in and shall not be able. Strive to enter in 
at the straight gate. And so there is, there are volitional acts that we must perform, that we must do in order to bring ourselves in to salvation. We hear the word, we are convicted by the word, and we, from our own self, we're not, we're, yes, we're drawn by the Holy Spirit. We are definitely drawn by the Holy Spirit. He brings conviction, but we are the ones who come. We are the ones who come. Yet, at the same time, God is sovereign. Okay? God is sovereign at the very same time. God works, we work, we believe, we trust him. We trust him. That's important. Verse number 17. I'm back in Romans chapter 9 and verse number 17. And he's going to bring up, uh, he's going to bring up Pharaoh. Pharaoh also, the, the, the story of Pharaoh and what God does uh, during this particular time uh, with Egypt uh, has also caused some much confusion as it pertains uh, to the sovereignty of of God. Uh, verse number 17, for the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, even for this same purpose, I have raised thee up that I might show my power in thee and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. He raised Pharaoh up for such a time as that. I was going to say such a time as this, but it's past tense. He raised Pharaoh up for such a time that was to show his power, to show his glory through, through uh, Pharaoh. Glory meaning that he would once again bring the children of Israel out um, and that his name might be declared through all the earth. Verse number 18, therefore hath he mercy on whom he will have mercy and whom he will, he hardeneth. He hardeneth. Whom he will, he hardeneth. Now, once again, that's a difficult statement for us to understand. What it simply means is uh, that the Bible says in the book of Exodus, we speak, we see at least 10 times, 10 times that uh, Exodus speaks of the fact that God, God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Why would God do such a thing? God hardened his heart. We also read in scripture uh, that we, we read in one place, which is not coming to me right now, but we read in scripture uh, that God could have stopped individuals from sinning against him. He could have intervened. God, in other words, letting us know that God can stop people from sinning against him. He can stop it. He's God. He's God. He can do anything. Okay? And but he doesn't choose to do that all the time. Because man makes his choices and he allows man's choices to have their effect. That's what God does. God allows man's choices to do what they do. Amen. That's important to understand. He allows man's choices to do what they will do. Um, so at least at least 10 times we read that he hardened Pharaoh's heart. He hardened the man's heart. Um, and once again, it sounds like something, something that, how could God do that? But once again, it's based on his foreknowledge of who Pharaoh was. It's based on who Pharaoh who he knew Pharaoh was. The Bible says that Pharaoh also hardened his own heart. Pharaoh hardened his heart and then God hardened it. And then Pharaoh hardened his heart and then God continued to harden his heart because he knew the man. He knew the man. He knew who he was dealing with. Amen. God's foreknowledge. Verse number 19. For thou, I mean, thou wilt say then unto me, why did he yet find fault? For who hath resisted his will? In other words, and, and this and this is a, a very blunt statement because Paul, as he's writing, he knows that people, what people are going to say, what people are going to think when these arguments are brought out in the open. And what he's saying here in verse number 19, the question is, 
How can God, okay, uh, how can God find fault? How can God find judgment if he has already set it up to be the way it ends up to be? How's he gonna how's he gonna blame how is God gonna blame man for 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 doing evil when he could have done something about it, but he didn't? He just let him do it when he you understand the argument. But once again, that is not what is going on here. That is not what is going on here. Okay. He says, nay, but O oh man. And now what he is going to say now is basically uh, a drop the mic moment, several of them in a row. Who are you to reply against God? That's what he's saying. Who are you? What, what are you talking about? How, how, how dare you ask such a question? How dare you? How dare you question God's motives? How dare you question what God is, what, what God's plan is? How dare you question his sovereignty? That's what he's saying here in verse number 19, verse number 20. Nay, O man, who art thou that replies against God? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, why hast thou made me thus? Thus. Who, what do you, who are you, to, who are you? It's almost like the, the argument that, that God gave to, to, uh, to, to, to Job. When he spoke to Job, when Job was questioning things during his during his uh, difficult time, during the end of it, God says, were you with me when I created the world? Were you there? Were you there when I set the oceans? Were you there when I put the start? Where, where were you? Where were you? And here he says, listen, who are you that replies against God? Who are you? Verse number 21. Here's a question. <clears throat> Has not the potter power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another un, uh, unto dishonor? The potter. God is that potter. Doesn't the potter have the power to mold and shape and do as he pleases with the clay that he has in his hands? Does not he have that right? The answer is of course yes. Yes. He is the potter and he does have power over the clay. Verse number 22 is another question. This question is, this question is three verses long. This question ends in verse number 24, but it starts here. What if God willing to show his wrath and to make his power known endured with much long suffering, the vessels of wrath fitted for destruction the vessels of wrath fitted for destruction who are the vessels of wrath fitted for destruction they are those who have not placed their faith in christ they are the unsaved they are the ones without christ they're the ones who have rejected the lord they are the vessels of wrath fitted or prepared for destruction. God has not prepared them for destruction. They have prepared themselves for destruction through their unbelief. The vessels of wrath fitted to destruction. They're setting themselves up for eternity through their unbelief. Setting themselves up for eternity through their unbelief. That is what they are doing. And that is what he is referring to here. And that, verse number 23, and that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he had afore prepared unto glory. Who are they? Who are the vessels of mercy, which he had afore prepared unto glory? Once again, talking about his foreknowledge that he knew that we would be here now. He knew that I would be here now speaking right now. I'm saved, I'm born again, I'm speaking right now. He knew that you would be on the other end listening right now, why? Because you're saved, you're born again. He knew, he knew that, he knew that. We are the vessels of mercy. We are the vessels of mercy which he afore prepared unto glory. Verse number 24. Even 
us. If you had any doubt as to who he was speaking about there, even us whom he hath called, not of the Jews only, but of the Gentiles. This ends that question started in verse number 22. We are not even Jews. We are Gentiles. We are Gentiles. Okay. Verse number 25. As he said also in Hosea, or other in Hosea, I'm reading from the King James Version. As he also said, saith in, in, in Hosea, I will call them my people, which were not my people, and her beloved, which was not beloved. Now, uh, as we read in, in the book of uh, Hosea, uh, chapter number two, he is speaking. He is speaking about the Jews and 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 their connection with the, the with the Assyrians that were coming against them. But he uses this verse. Paul uses this verse in reference to the Gentiles. Okay, I will call them my people. Them, the Gentiles, you and I. I will call them my people, which were not my people. We were not. We were not. And her beloved, which was not beloved. That's us. We have been grafted in. Remember, we have been grafted in. Verse number 26. Okay? And, and what he's driving at here, he's driving at the fact that there is a spiritual Israel. And that the spiritual Israel uh, is, is beyond the national Israel. The spiritual Israel, who we are, is the church. We are spiritual Israel. Amen? Verse number 26, and it shall come to pass that in the place where it was said unto them, ye are not my people, there shall they be called the children of the living God. Once again, he is talking about the church. Let me go to Galatians chapter number six, Galatians chapter number six and verse number 16. Here's what it says. And as many as walk, According to this rule, peace be on them and mercy and upon the Israel of God. Who are the Israel of God? The church. We are. And the Israel of God comprises both Jew and Gentile. Everyone who comes to Christ by faith, we are the Israel of God. Amen. The Israel of God. That's important to remember. That's who we are. Verse number 27. Isaiah also crieth concerning Israel. Though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, a remnant shall be saved. A remnant shall be saved. A remnant of Jews shall be saved, for he will finish the work. He's quoting, once again, he's quoting from Isaiah chapter number 10. For he will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness, because a short work will the Lord make upon the earth. He's going to finish the work. And everything that, he has, everything that God has decreed will come to pass. Everything, everything, every jot, every tittle. It will come to pass, just as he has spoken, just as he has decreed it. Verse number 40, 28, verse number 29. And as Isaiah said before, except the Lord of Sabbath had left us a seed, we had been as Sodom and had been made like unto Gomorrah. That's from Isaiah chapter 1 and verse number 9. Had not God intervened and had not God, God uh, kept for himself a remnant, Israel would have been destroyed, taken away, taken away by their own sin, by their own sin, not sin that God forced upon them, not sin that God created and made them do. By their own doing, they did what they did. By their own doing. You and I do what we do because we did what we did. <laughs> okay? God does not force our decisions. He does not force our decisions. 
But at the same time, I repeat again, God has foreknowledge and he knows the choice that you and I will make. He knows the choices that you and I will make. Verse number 30. And he's going to sum this up. What shall we say then? That the Gentiles, which followed not after righteousness, he's bringing this to a head here in these next few verses as he closes out this chapter. That the Gentiles, which followed not after righteousness, have attained righteousness, even the righteousness which is of faith. We come to the Lord Jesus Christ by faith. If you are in Christ, you're watching right now, you're listening right now. If you are born again, you came to Christ by faith. We read this further in Acts uh, chapter number uh, 26. Acts chapter number 26 and verse uh, number 18. I love this verse. Acts number 26 and verse number 18. It says, to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light. This is this is uh, Christ speaking to Paul uh, during his, uh, when he was thrown off uh, the animal uh, when he was on his way to Damascus. To open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. How, you, how did you get saved? By faith. How did you get sanctified? By faith. It is by grace through faith, and that not of yourself and that not of yourself. It can be stated, it can be stated that your faith is not even your own. Your faith is not even your own. Your, your heart had to be opened up to receive. And that was the Holy Spirit, the convicting power of the Holy Spirit opens you up. Faith, I believe you're saved. And that's how it happens. That's how it happens, amen? Verse number 31. But Israel, he's making this contrast between, between those who come uh, to Christ by faith and those who try to live a life pleasing to God by another way. Verse number 31. <clears throat> but Israel, which followed after the law of righteousness, hath not attained to the law of of righteousness. <clears throat> Israel sought to be justified on the basis of works. Israel sought to be justified on the basis of law keeping, but they never obtained the righteousness that they were seeking. They thought they were. They thought they had righteousness based on their law keeping, but they did not. They did not receive the righteousness that they were seeking. And so verse number 32 says, wherefore, why, 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 why didn't Israel receive the righteousness that they were seeking by keeping the law? Because they sought it not by faith. I got to do, I got to do, I got to do. This is what Jesus meant uh, in Matthew. Let me go to Matthew uh, chapter number 11. Let me go there real quick. This is what Jesus meant. In Matthew chapter number 11 uh, and verse number 28, when he said, come unto me, all ye that labor, work, work, work. All ye that labor and are heavy laden, the work of trying to keep the law, the work of trying to, to do everything just right, cause an individual to be heavy laden, burdened down. I can't do this. I can't do this. This is too much. And that, that's what happens to every single person who attempts to live the Christian life through works. Every Christian person who attempts, who attempts to live the Christian life by keeping law, they will fall into the trap of works-based righteousness. And it will become, the Christian life will become a burden. The Christian life will become a burden. That's why Jesus says this to the Pharisees and to all those who are listening. 
Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Rest from what? Rest from your, from your laboring. Rest from your trying to get it right and make it right and do right and be right. Rest. Take my yoke upon you. Not the yoke of the law. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. That's what, that's what he desires. We have to come to Christ by faith. If you are listening right now, if you're watching right now, and you're trying to attain righteousness by just doing, I'm, I just got to do more. I got to pray more. I got to read more. I got to do more stuff. You are, you have, you have made your Christian life a series of, of, of laws doing this just right, do, doing this just right. And as long as I do this and do this, then God is happy and I'm happy. What happens if you fall off? Oh, God is not happy. That's a burden. That's a burden. That's not how we are called to live the Christian life. We are sanctified by faith that is in him. We live by faith. Amen. We live by faith. Verse number 32, continuing. But as it were by the works of the law, this is how they were trying to live. This is how they were trying to attain righteousness. For they stumbled at that stumbling stone. They stumbled at that stumbling stone. As it is written, verse number 33, Behold, I lay in Zion, a stumbling stone and rock of offense and whosoever believeth on him, on him shall not be ashamed or put to shame. Jesus Christ is that stumbling stone. The Jews stumbled at Jesus. When Jesus came on the scene, they stumbled at him. It can't be him. No, it's not him. They stumbled. He was that rock of offense. We read in 1 Peter chapter number 2, and we'll close here. Uh, 1 Peter chapter number 2, uh, verses 6 to 8. Wherefore also it is contained in scripture. Here's what it says. Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, talking about Christ. And he that believeth on him shall not be confounded or put to shame. Amen. So it says, unto you, therefore, which believe, he is precious. He is precious. Have you found that to be the case, that he is precious? But unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders rejected or disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner. Amen? Amen and a stone of stumbling, and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. Once again, that's based on God's foreknowledge. If you reject, if you reject him, it shows that you are in a bad way. If you reject him, it shows that you are in a bad way. Amen. So God is good. God is good. And, and yes, some of these things that we have spoken tonight can be difficult for the hearing. But once again, we have to leave it in God's hand that God is absolutely sovereign over everything. Amen. Brother Frank has a comment here. I agree the initial faith through the born again experience was not mine. He made a believer out of me, thus the ability to have the have true faith and belief. Yes, it's it's all God. It's all it's all God. It's completely all God. Amen. Remember, the Bible says that we were dead, dead in trespasses and sins. Dead, 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 dead. Okay, so that's important to understand. Amen. So I didn't think that we would conclude uh, the entire chapter tonight, but we actually did. Well, that's fine. Next week, Lord willing, we will pick up in chapter number 10. This is our verse-by-verse -verse study through the book of Romans. We have 
We still have 11, uh, 12, <clears throat> 13. We still have up until chapter 16. So we are not close to ending to ending this particular book. We have much, much to go. Amen. There's much yet to be spoken uh, in the book of Romans. Amen. So we pray that once again, you've heard something uh, that has stirred your heart, uh, that has opened up your heart <clears throat> to God's word. And we pray that we, you have heard something that you can take with you. Amen. And if you don't take anything else with you, I'm going to repeat it again. Take with you that God is sovereign and he is in complete control. Amen. Well, amen. Let me invite you to join us. We'll be back here. Uh, Lord willing, we'll be back here on tomorrow night. Tomorrow night, 8 o'clock p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, our hot topic, our hot topic Tuesday. And our hot topic uh, tomorrow night is a very serious one. Uh, and that topic is tomorrow night, dear church, please come home, dear church, please come home. And it's an, uh, it's a, uh, an urgent call. I have to call it that it's an urgent call for God's people to unite around the cross of Christ. Amen. That'll be tomorrow night, eight o'clock PM Eastern standard time. If you're watching on YouTube link, uh, send somebody the link. If you're watching on Facebook, uh, make sure that you let someone know. Uh, that we'll be discussing some very important things on tomorrow night. Amen. Wednesday night, Wednesday night, we're going to continue uh, in our cross-talking sessions uh, as we continue in the book of Ephesians chapter number one. Amen. Uh, and on Sunday, Sunday, uh, we are going to begin a brand new, a brand new series. Uh, and that series is entitled Experiencing Selah experiencing Selah. Sounds strange to you? It shouldn't. The word Selah we find in the book of Psalms several times over. And we're going to be discussing and pausing uh, to remember uh, and praise God for the many facets of his goodness and power. Amen. That word Selah is a word that uh, by all intents and purposes, it means to pause. It means to pause. And we're going to pause and we're going to remember who God is and remember his power and his goodness. We're going to be doing that uh, for the next several weeks on Sunday. That'll be Sunday, 4 o'clock p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Amen. And so with that, we thank you for joining us. If you need to know who we are, we are That's The Word Ministries. Uh, you can go to our website at that's the word .org. Uh, you can also uh, You can also go uh, to our YouTube channel, which is That's The Word Ministries. You can also go to Spreaker.com. You'll find the other podcasts that the Lord has enabled us to produce uh, over the years. Amen. So once again, thank you, Linda, for being here. God bless you. Uh, Kathleen, of course. Keisha, amen. Uh, thank you for joining us also. Dawn, Frank, uh, Pam Callahan, person, thank you for watching. Linda Bennett, amen. Thank you for watching. Patty Black and Yvonne, thank you also for being with us, amen. God bless you. Thank you for joining us, and we will see you hopefully tomorrow night, if you can, uh, 8 o'clock p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Dear Church. Please come home. That's tomorrow night. God bless you, and we'll see you then. Have a good night, and God bless.